Our next speaker is Dr. Ron Melnick. Uh, Ron Melnick, PhD, is an independent consultant and was a senior toxicologist for 28 years in the National Toxology Programme. He led the design of the NTP toxicology and carcinogenic studies of cell phone radiation in rodents. This research, I think, is probably one of the most important pieces of research that's, that's ever taken place. And I'm proud to be able to introduce Ron, but you can also understand why people, ICNAB, are panicking about his research. Thank you for that invitation and the nice statements. Uh, the National Toxicology Program is considered by many as the premier testing program for toxicity and carcinogenicity. They've published almost 600 technical reports on carcinogenicity. It's located, it's headquartered at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. So I want to go through a series of aspects of my talk. I'll talk a little bit about the National Toxicology Program and its nomination of cell phone radiofrequency radiation for research, the exposure system that was used in the NTP studies, the design of the experimental studies, the major findings, and then the application of those findings for future risk assessments. There's both a qualitative which is done by IARC, and a quantitative, which should be done by the US Food and Drug Administration, such that exposure standards could be developed that would be health-based. Uh, within the US, the regulatory responsibilities are shared by the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Communication Com Commission. So the National Toxicology Program began in 1978 it was an effort to bring together toxicity research in different agencies within the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and uh, Human Services. Uh, we have a, there's a director, NIEH, it's, uh, the director of NIEHS is also the director of the National Toxicology Program. It's composed of the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, the Center for Disease Control, uh, and National Cancer Institute had been where actually it originated. There's oversight by a number of agencies because the NTP provides data for regulatory decisions to assess risk and create a disease prevention effort. Uh, the oversight includes agencies which you've probably heard of, National Cancer Institute, FDA, Environmental Protection Agency, etc. So the, the National Toxicology Program process involves nominations from any source. Uh, it may be from the public, federal and state agencies, uh, organizations, labor, industry. Uh, the nominations come into the program and they undergo a federal agency review. The nomination for cell phone radio frequency radiation came from the Food and Drug Administration. And they requested, this was almost 20 years ago, toxicity and carcinogenicity studies in experimental animals for, to provide, I have this in quotes, the basis to assess the risk to human health. And why? Because at that time, existing exposure guidelines are based on protection from acute injury, from thermal effects, which we've heard of, of RF exposure, and they may not be protective against non-thermal effects of chronic exposure. So, in 1996, the FCC guidelines for radiofrequency radiation was designed to protect against adverse effects that might occur due to increase in tissue or body temperature of one degree centigrade. This was done by exposing monkeys and determining what would be the SAR, which we've heard about, this is the amount of energy absorbed per unit mass of tissue or over the whole body. And with a 
at a, the one degree centigrade temperature rise, the SAR value, the energy absorbed, is four watts per kilogram on a whole body basis. Based on that kind of information, they've applied a number 50-fold to say this would be safe for humans of 0.08 watts per kilogram over the whole body. But as mentioned earlier, there's a difference between the whole body and a localized exposure area. So over the one gram of tissue in the US, it's 1.6 watts per kilogram. In, in Europe, with ICNRP, it's two watts per kilogram. Now, take a look at the logic of this. If my pen is an antenna, if I hold that next to my head and that antenna is emitting radiation, the amount of radiation that's absorbed, if I divide it by my whole body weight, is going to dilute out the effect that's happening in that local area. So the, to me and others, the critical aspect is that 1.6 watt per kilogram. Is that adequate? If we take a look at it in the reverse sense, if we exposed animals to 0.08 watts per kilogram, that's a whole body, we would be underexposing the brain by a factor of 20. And that makes no sense for assessing human risk. Okay, animals are used in research uh, as a disease prevention strategy for humans. And this is because of similar biological processes. Uh, every known human carcinogen has been shown to be carcinogenic in animals. And in many cases, the animal studies came first. Uh, the exposures can be controlled very carefully. So this can eliminate confounding by other factors. And if they are taken seriously, they can avoid the need to wait for the cancer data to develop in humans. Uh, this is because there may be a long latency for disease to occur, and why uh, not set a prevention strategy before we see cancers developing in humans. So the objectives of the NTP studies were twofold. One is to test or ch challenge the hypothesis or assumption. At the time, there was the assumption, and the, the assumptions still exist, that radio frequency radiation cannot cause effects other than through heating tissue because there was insufficient energy, photon energy, to break bonds, especially to cause DNA damage. Uh, and if we saw an effect, could we provide information to do some type of dose response uh, analysis? Okay. The exposure system used by the NTP is not this one. Uh, when we began our studies, we were aware of studies being done in conjunction with the WHO and industry in which animals were exposed in this Ferris wheel type of exposure. You may be able to see the little white animals. They are restrained in tubes. During their exposure, the antenna is in the center and that is moving around so that the animals are constantly exposed. But when the animals are restrained in these tubes, they don't have access to water, and the exposure duration was therefore limited to two hours. We felt that this was not an adequate challenge for whether or not the assumption has any validity. So what we wanted was a system where we could expose a relatively large number of animals, 100, but you have to remember that when you do an animal study, the sensitivity of the assay is limited to, uh, for statistical purposes, of 5% or 10% elevation. With 50 animals or 100 animals in a group, uh, we're trying to understand a risk that can be applied to humans where the human risk ex is not acceptable. Obviously, at 10%, that's epidemic. Uh, what is the risk at one per thousand or one per hundred thousand? And you can't get that when you have a hundred animals in a group. So typically in a toxicity study, you use higher doses and you do an extrapolation. Okay. 
We also wanted the system to be shielded. We wanted to create a homogeneous environment. Uh, power levels were not to exceed the animal's ability to thermoregulate, maintain their body temperature. Uh, there were cage racks, et cetera, that would have minimal RF absorption. We needed to control temperature, humidity. The frequencies and modulations were to reflect those which are in use. 900 and 1900 megahertz were at the center of bands used in mobile phone communications. And there were two modulations that we used. GSM, which you heard about, it's the pulsed. And CDMA, which I believe is like UMTS, it's a low frequency modulation on the carrier. And the chronic studies, the cancer studies, were to include three power levels uh, per sex per species plus a sham chamber uh, as well for rats, mice of each sex. This is what a, the reverberation chamber looks like. Uh, on the left shows the empty chamber, and in that chamber is an excitation antenna as well as uh, ventilation panels. Uh, the, ex the radiation is emitted from the antenna, but there are paddles which are vertical and horizontal that are turning at a very slow rate, and they're creating a homogeneous electromagnetic environment inside that chamber. And on the right side, it shows what that chamber looks like with the two cage racks so that we could house 100 animals individually caged. Uh, by using this kind of system, as opposed to the Ferris wheel, there's no limit on the exposure time. Uh, and no, but there's no histor comparable historical control rate. So it's, it's a very different system than uh, used by any others. This just shows what it looks like inside a rat and mouse. These are model simulations. Uh, in the mouse, you can see at 900, it's very little SAR absorbed, but well absorbed at 1900. And converse in the rat, well absorbed internally at 900 and 19, and not at 1900 megahertz. And part of the reason for that is that the tails were absorbing at the wavelengths where there was not a good uh, distribution of energy within inside the animals. The very, I don't know what the pointer is. The, the, the very last one, you can see the red and yellow show where the absorption is highest in the mouse at 900 in the tail, and the, for the rat at uh, 1900, or 1 1.9 gigahertz. However, if you look at the brain, it's very little deviation from the whole body exposure. So when we talk about a whole body exposure in this particular system, is very similar to the exposure within the brain of the, each animal. Okay, so the design of the studies. First, we needed to demonstrate that there was a uh, field uniformity. And this was done by placing water bottles in different locations with a simulation fluid to show that we could create within those cages a homogeneous environment, and that was done uh, in chambers that were loaded with racks and bottles containing the simulation fluid. Uh, throughout the study, there must be continuous monitoring of field uniformity. The exposures were 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off for 18 hours a day. The hours off were for uh, weighing animals, providing uh, cleaning of animals, checking them for clinical signs. And the, the first study that was done was a, what we call a thermal pilot study. This was to determine what are the effects of various levels of SAR uh, with both GSM and CDMA on body temperature because we wanted to keep the temperature rise less than one degree centigrade since that's the basis for the uh, exposure standards. Uh, this was done by using a subcutaneous implanted temperature microchip Animals were exposed similarly as they would in the toxicity studies uh, nine hours a day. And this helped lead to the design of what kind of exposure intensity we could use. There were pre-chronic studies then to determine, again, power levels, 
uh, based on the temperature uh, measurements from the microchips, the SAR in rats actually could tolerate up to nine watts per kilogram, and mice up to 15. In the chronic exposure, the number of animals used were 90, and the exposures in rats began during gestation, from gestation day five, and after weaning for two years. Uh, it, both GSM and CDMA modulations were used. Uh, for spray dolly rats, the exposure intensities were 0, 1.5, 3, and 6 watts per kilogram. So if you go back to the, what we're talking about of 1.6 watts per kilogram as an exposure that is permitted, we're overlapping at 1.5 and not that much higher when you look at 3 and 6 watts per kilogram. Animals underwent complete necropsy and histopathology looking at 40 different organs for effects. Uh, okay. And there was also an interim sacrifice and one of the endpoints looked at in the interim sacrifice were for uh, DNA damage uh, in the brains since this had been reported many years ago and uh, disputed by others. This is what the final systems look like. There were 21 chambers because we had rats, mice, both sexes, uh, three different power levels plus shams. Okay, NTP has a certain definitions on how they characterize the carcinogenic activity in a study. Clear evidence means there is a dose-related increase of malignant uh, tumors or an increase of combination of malignant and benign tumors or that have the ability to progress to malignancy. Uh, these terms get used later and that's why I present them now. Some evidence means there is an exposure related increase of malignant or benign combined tumors. So clear evidence is obvious. Some means it's still agent related. Equivocal means there is a increase in tumors. It's marginal that may be related, but it, NTP doesn't rely strictly 100% on statistics. There's other factors that influence that evaluation. For example, is it a common tumor or is it an uncommon tumor? Are there also proliferative lesions that are observed at the same site? Hyperplasias are increased uh, numbers of cells in a specific uh, focal area, which are typically preneoplastic, have the ability to progress onto tumors so that we also uh, consider those in the evaluation of carcinogenicity. So what were some of the findings? As I mentioned, uh, the rats began with in utero gestational exposure, and there was a decrease in birth weights of pups uh, in relationship to the exposure intensity. Uh, it was significant at the six watts per kilogram with both GSM and CDMA, uh, when you see stars under the sham, the zero value, that means it's a significant trend. It's moving in a positive direction. If it's in an exposure group, it means the pairwise comparison of the exposure group to the control was statistically significant. This, these are at the 0.01 value. Another effect that was observed was cardiomyopathy. This is a disease of heart muscle of the right ventricle was seen in both male rats and in female rats. Uh, in male rats with both GSM and CDMA, in female rats with just the GSM. Uh, I mentioned that we looked at uh, evidence of DNA damage, and you can see that with CDMA in the frontal cortex, there was a significant increase in one or more exposure groups and a significant trend. The green box for the CDMA and female rats shows that there was a significant trend. There was increase in DNA damage in the hippocampus and there was increase in uh, DNA damage in the frontal cortex of, of mice uh, with both GSM and CDMA. The yellow means that there was a non-significant increase, but it was greater than twofold in at least one of the exposure groups. 
Okay, so what were some of the lesions? I think Leonard mentioned a few of these. Uh, there were increases in tumors of the heart, and these are the schwannomas. Uh, the schwannoma is the sheath around the nerve. Uh, with both GSM and CDMA, the B in this case indicates that there was a, uh, a significant trend with both GSM and CDMA. Trend analysis is important because it's not just what you see in a pairwise comparison. Is there a tendency to increase with uh, exposure intensity? There were also Schwann cell hyperplasias, and the bottom line shows you uh, what the total proliferative uh, effect was, so that 10% of the animals, for example, with CDMA uh, had uh, a Schwann, Schwannoma or Schwann cell hyperplasia. Uh, there were tumors in the brain, these are gliomas, as well as uh, the preneoplastic uh, glial cell hyperplasias, and you can see that there was significant uh, increase with the CDMA uh, as well as with the GSM. Now, one criticism that has been leveled against this study was that these tumor differences were due to survival differences, that the control animals uh, died earlier than the exposed animals and therefore they didn't have enough time to develop a tumor. However, if you look at the black line is the control and the, what is it, this square, I believe. The square is the CDMA, six watt per kilogram. If you recall, I mentioned that's where we saw the most significant effect. At 93 weeks, there was no difference between control and the six watt per kilogram CDMA, indicating that's really not the explanation. Uh, and when you look at the overall curve, this six watt per kilogram CDMA was not statistically different than the control. But also, there were glial cell hyperplasias, these are the precancerous lesions, and or heart schwannomas, none were observed in the control rats, even though Glial cell hyperplasia was detected in exposed rats as early as week 58 in the two-year study. So there was time for something to happen in the control rats, and the heart schwannomas were detected as early as week 70. So again, if an exposed animal developed it at 70, there was enough time of survival for the control rats. So. Uh, this is, there was sufficient time for this, and I think this has just become a bogus argument. There were other proliferative lesions in the prostate gland. This doesn't get uh, mentioned very often, but there were adenomic carcinomas, for example, increased in the GSM at three watts per kilogram, and there were uh, proliferative lesions, uh, the uh, epithelial hyperplasia. Now, NTP has never identified a prostate carcinogen in the 600 agents that have been tested. This was considered by the peer review group to be equivocal, but I see this as demonstrating quite clearly that there are proliferative lesions, and the NTP identifies it as, as a, a lesion affecting in the prostate. So there's a prostate hyperplasia and a good likelihood of a prostate cancer risk associated with uh, GSM and CDMA uh, uh, exposures. In the adrenal gland, there were significant increases in pheochromocytomas uh, in the GSM group. Uh, in mice, if you look at lung tumors, these are alveolar, bronchial, or adenomas, or carcinomas. Uh, there was an inc a significant trend, the 26, 27, 36, 38, and that trend is largely due to carcinomas. You can see the highest number was as the exposure uh, intensity increases. This was only given an equivocal by the peer review, although there looks like something significant is happening there. <coughs> 
So overall, the evidence was summarized here for heart schwannomas, clear evidence, clear evidence for heart in male rats, equivocal. There were some in female rats. Uh, the historical rate for female rats is much lower than in male rats. In fact, it's very unusual to see them in a female rat. Uh, and there were some seen in the exposure groups. There's some evidence of carcinogenicity for CDMA and GSM for the brain gliomas and some for the ad adrenal gland. A number of the others were equivocal. Typically, NTP studies don't identify so many equivocal findings. So the key findings from the NTP studies are that the cell phone radiation caused cancers and preneoplastic lesions in the heart and brain. There were also proliferative lesions in the prostate gland, DNA damage in brain cells of rats and mice, there was heart muscle disease, and reduced birth weights. So we go back to that original assumption, the assumption that non-ionizing radiation cannot cause cancer by, or other adverse effects other than tissue heating is clearly wrong. So what can, should be done with the NTP data? How should this information be applied for both qualitative and quantitative risk assessment? Qualitative meaning it is a carcinogen or it's likely a carcinogen. Quantitative would be what is the risk in relationship to exposure? Okay. As mentioned earlier in 2011, IARC uh, labeled radiofrequency radiation as a possible human carcinogen. This was based on the way IARC does their evaluations. The evidence in humans was considered to be limited. Now, there were positive associations, as uh, Professor Hardell mentioned, from exposure to RF radiation from wireless phones for glioma and acoustic neuromas. Uh, the reason was that these were case control studies and the cohort studies, large populations, were considered to be negative, but there's potential misclassifications of exposures when you do very large population studies. For the case control studies, which were positive, the group felt that it's, there was the potential for selection and recall bias. In other words, when you uh, interview a, a case and you ask them how, mu how much use they had of their cell phone, they may have overstated it, uh, or they may have said, this is the side of the head where the tumor is. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Hardell can comment more on that, because the questionnaires are not just related to your cell phone use. It's, a, it's a, an extensive questionnaire uh, that doesn't focus just on cell phone use, but you're interviewing cases and controls separately uh, and trying to determine the amount of cell phone use in relationship to whether they're a case or a control. At that time, there was limited evidence in experimental animals. That's based because the data that were available were largely co-carcinogenicity studies where animals were exposed to a carcinogen and then radiofrequency radiation. So overall, this was considered a possible carcinogen to humans. When you have limited evidence in humans, and live in, in experimental animals. As mentioned earlier then, there's an unusual, a strong concordance between rats and mice, uh, rats and humans, in the cell types affected. The NTP saw cancers in the heart, schwannomas, and brain, gliomas, and IARC uh, in the evaluation said, radiofrequency radiation is possibly carcinogenic to humans based largely on increases in gliomas and acoustic neuromas and this was from both the IARC-sponsored Interphone study and Hardell's Swedish case control studies. Okay. This is a slide which tries to tell you how IARC makes their decision. They look at animal data and human data. Sufficient evidence means there's a causal relationship between exposure and human cancer. It's causal, chance bias, confounding have been ruled out with reasonable confidence. Limited evidence means 
a causal interpretation between exposure is credible, but chance bias or confounding could not be reasonably ruled out. And that was the reason for limited evidence in the previous. In experimental animals, sufficient evidence means there's an increased incidence of malignant or benign uh, tumors in two or more species or two or more independent studies or an unusual type of tumor, unusual degree with regard to incidence, site, or type of tumor. Uh, the schwannomas and the gliomas are rare tumors in animals and they would fit into that category. Limited evidence means the data suggests a carcinogenic effect but it's not definitive. Uh, this is because they may be limited only to promotional activity. So when, after looking at the animal data, the human data, IARC makes their determinations of whether it should be in a category of possibly, probably, or carcinogenic to humans. If there's limited evidence in humans or sufficient evidence in animals, or strong mechanistic information, that would be a group too big. Probably carcinogenic would still be limited evidence in humans and sufficient in animals. In other words, with no additional human data, if IARC accepts the NTP studies as well as the Ramazzini studies and concludes that there is sufficient in animals, cell phone radiation would be listed as a probable human carcinogen. And, or there may be limited evidence in humans and strong mechanistic information. To be carcinogenic in humans, which is group one, means there needs to be sufficient evidence of cancer in humans. And that's where the epidemiology studies would come in. Or sufficient evidence of cancer in animals and strong mechanistic evidence in exposed humans. So IARC looks at human data, animal data, as well as mechanistic data. And there seems to be a, a growing amount of mechanistic data supporting a uh, adverse effect or carcinogenic effect. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have been done since IARC, and this is certainly not a complete list. Uh, I think it was mentioned that there was an increase in risk of glioma uh, in the uh, French and, uh, national study, Coria. Uh, there was a study done by the Canadian group that participated in the Interphone study and showed that the risk of glioma was not affected by selection or recall bias. And that has a big impact because the limited evidence was based on the potential for selection or recall bias. And Phillips has shown that the incidence of glioblastoma in the front and temporal lobes has doubled in England's between 1995 and 2015. The animal studies have increased. In addition to the NTP, we'll be hearing about the Ramazzini studies after lunch. But uh, another group, Lurkel, who didn't believe in this type of effect, uh, went to try to reproduce a study which had been available during the IARC evaluation in which animals were treated with ENU, ethyl nitrosyurea, it's carcinogen, and then exposed. And he reproduced the findings. And uh, so the findings of Tillman from 2010 were then reproduced by Lurkel in 2015. And mechanistic studies, you heard a lot about the calcium gate control this morning, but there's also oxidative stress which may be occurring from radiation exposure itself by uh, increasing the time before free radicals can combine. And this oxidative stress can lead to mutations, chromosomal translocations, instability in the genome. And in studies that were published of 100 studies, 93 were dealt, uh, showed oxidative effects at low intensity RFR. So what is the next steps that FDA and FCC? Obviously from the qualitative standpoint, uh, I don't think there's any doubt where uh, RF radiation will be if IARC does the right, correct job. Uh, but remember I said 
it was FDA, Food and Drug Administration, who nominated uh, cell phone radiation to the NTP to, in order to determine what would be the risk to humans. So at this point, FDA has declined, but they need to fulfill the intent of their nomination uh, and to conduct a quantitative risk assessment so that health protective exposure standards can be developed. So what I've shown is the way some of the agencies deal with chemical toxicity when under the consideration that there is a linear uh, relationship between exposure and response. This could be done, uh, as I showed you with the prostate, the increase was seen at the intermediary exposure, uh, and that, that would be a nonlinear dose response. Very difficult for agencies on how to quantify risk because what this shows, and I, I try to put out the X's uh, for the schwannoma, hyperplasias, and tumors. If, if we put those on a graph, so what's the probability of a tumor versus the expo uh, an exposure that gives a 10% response, they fit a model to the data. And you may see some type of curved line. LED 10 stands for the lowest effective dose where there's a 10% response. In US EPA draws a straight line, assuming linearity, from that LED 10 down to zero uh, exposure. Because what you're interested in is not the 10% risk. What is the risk in one per 100,000? Even one per 100,000 when you consider five billion cell phones are being used throughout the world, uh, one in 100,000, even one in a million, is still a lot. Uh, and that's where the argument will go is, should it be a linear or a nonlinear? The rationale for claiming this is all due to heating effects is to say it can't be linear. It only happens when you see heating effects. And that's where the aspect of how to quantify risk will come into play. So at this point, FDA needs to do their quantitative risk assessment, determine what is the cancer risk with exposure, and the exposure would be the SAR emitted from a phone, and that kind of information is available. There, or it is, they will send you to a website to list what is the uh, output of that phone. And I'm, sh I'm not sure if everybody recognizes when the phone is showing few bars, it is working harder. It is, so if you're out later, uh, power is weak, uh, outputting stronger up to approaching its maximum. So what does the public need to know? There have been multiple studies have found increases in cancer associated with exposure to radio frequency radiation. This is animals and humans. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, even a small increase in cancer risk would have a serious public health impact. I strongly feel precautionary principles should be promoted by health and regulatory agencies, especially for children and pregnant women. The, the, the agencies in the U.S. say, if you are concerned, that puts the burden on the individual. It doesn't say, we are concerned. It, it should be very straightforward. Precautionary principles should be promoted because, as mentioned earlier, risk can be greater for children than adults due to the increased penetration of the radiation within brains of children, and the developing nervous system is more susceptible to tissue-damaging agents. So finally, uh, what is the lesson that should be learned? When dealing with assumptions, uh, I think we've shown that assumptions in this case can be wrong. So that we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing. Thank you. So you can see why ICNAB are concerned. <laughs>
with that research. And that is the first time that this has been presented in the UK. So that's a first for the RRT. Thank you very much indeed for coming across from the States to the UK. I think it's true to say that Lurchill had been an opponent of all uh, the of uh, cancer in mice and rats until he did his own study and then found that he was actually mistaken. And I think I'm true to say he's now apologised for his mistake-ish. Thank you.